can't give an example because I've never been there. Sure. <laughs> but they will, the uh, whoever your, your your skilled people are will sit down and talk with the local people about what this thing is. It's called a body of water. Now they will, you know, they understand water. But you can use enough phrases and words to explain that there are some places where there's an awful lot of water all in one place. So it doesn't change the, the it doesn't change the story. It just changes the way the story is explained. Yeah, you never change the story. Yeah. Do you think there's, uh, I guess, from your experiences with translating into other languages, um, do you do you encounter places where you say, "Boy, we're we're reading that wrong in English." Um. I, I, well, let's let's. I don't know how to answer that one, Justin. You answer me an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I hear from people, my colleagues who've been engaged in translation, is that they come away with a much deeper appreciation of what the text says because they've got gotten into it at a level that they don't normally get into. What language are they using as the baseline? It depends. Uh, obviously, they don't. You, do, you can't teach the guy Roman or not Roman, biblical Greek or Hebrew. You'll typically use a translation in a language that the translators understand and speak. Frequently, you, most of these people groups speak two or three different languages, maybe more. You find a translation, a good quality one, that they can understand. And they'll kind of use that as a model. But the the in this case, the Wycliffe guy and the consultant have access to other kinds of technical aids that help them uh, really exegete the text well and to make sure that what was said in the original is what gets said in the translation. There, there's an interesting theory, it's an old theory and highly discredited that you can check a translation by making sure that there's the same number of words in the first language as in the second. And that doesn't work. <laughs> but some people believe it, they really do. No, I, you go for concept. Not number of words. <laughs> so yeah. what's sorry? That's really interesting to me because uh, I've dealt with a lot of translators, Good. Uh, and I found I found this to be both interesting and frustrating at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, who? What is the kind of I guess conflict breaker on things like, for example, in Spanish? There's no word for there's no Spanish word for covenant, which is a very significant word mm -hmm. in everything we teach, and so. <laughs> They've developed, uh, or their their text says uh, the equivalent of pact or mm -hmm. promise, mm -hmm. um, but it's a very loose term, and it's not it's not it doesn't carry the same significance to them or the mm -hmm. same weight to them. And so I've always been curious, like who decides that? What's the process by which it's decided that that was the best word mm -hmm. in lack of this other mm -hmm. concept? Mm -hmm. You know how how does that whole thing flush out? And and what's the you know what's the the, the the I guess the breaker of conflict if, if the word just simply doesn't exist. In the case of Spanish, you got problem because you now have history, and you know how some people look at King James. I mean, God spoke King James, for some people, and therefore you can't change it. And with you use the Reina translation in Spanish. We use all sorts of changes depending on where you're at. All right. Sometimes whatever word they have chosen to use there has become so much of a standard that you can't really change it. But where you can, you, well, where, where you can, you start working, you take the central word they've got and find ways to improve it, if you will, with a phrase. So if you know, if you look in English, you've got an agreement, you've got a covenant, you've got a pact, and you probably, you probably have another couple of words like that as well. If the only word they've got is pact, and that means some sort of a loose agreement, then typically a translator is going to spend some time discussing the concept, and they'll find they'll probably come up with a phrase that basically communicates a pretty good, solid, solid serious pact that you know, doesn't get broken. Uh -huh. You know, that's the kind of covenant that God made with us. Uh, and so that's and built into the text. Well, and then you go out and you check it. And you say, you know, what is this? What's this phrase mean to you? And these are intelligent people; they can tell you what they mean. <coughs> and if they can come back with you with a pretty reasonable understanding, then you will probably use that term in your translation. Now, you still have to run it by the translation consultant because he may see some issues that you have. 
but it's uh, it's quite a challenge sometimes to find those those kind of words. What do you think is the uh, overall financial side of translating a New Testament or a whole Bible or whatever? I mean, well, imagine it as a lot of cost. If you're counting on if you're counting money, the return on investment doesn't work. No, no, I don't mean return. Just what's it cost? Um, uh, well, let me finish my other thought. If you if you count from a spiritual, a more spiritual standpoint, it's worth everything we put into it. Agreed. Um, the cost for translation depends on how many translators there are, what kind of salaries are appropriate for that kind of a, a place. It wouldn't be unusual to pay to wind up over the course of a New Testament to, to wind up with some place between fifteen thousand, thirty thousand dollars. Well, that's it. And yeah, that, that's, that's actually and that and that's not that's counting pretty impressive. That's not counting the financial support of guys like me or and my wife. We have to raise our own support. But if we're living there and we have bills to pay and all the rest of it, that raises the number another quite a bit higher. Mm -hmm. But it's but it all depends on, on, on what's the scale you want to minister it on. You never sell enough copies of these translated books to ever get anywhere near a return on investment. Typically, once it's translated and approved and checked and all of those things, then it's sent 